Systems Engineering and Innovation at Siemens. Uh, 13 years at Network Rail prior to that. Uh, railway Infrastructure Engineer in the British Army in his spare time. And then the spare time above and beyond, above and beyond that is also undertaking a PhD. So that's a, that's a pretty full life, all, all built around engineering and mainly around the, the kind of engineering we'll be hearing about tonight, no doubt. So, uh, OK, uh, Richard, over, over to you. And oh, we've got two more coming in as well. Excellent. So thank you very much, Ben. Um, I'm to introduce Daniel as well. <laughs> and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to introduce Daniel in a moment. But first of all, I'm just going to say, it's only a tiny bit intimidating being stood in front of all the asset engineers. <laughs> uh, and the traction power designer, EMC designer um, of the, uh, the scheme. So uh, hopefully it will be, uh, it will meet your um, expectations. Um, Daniel has been part of uh, this journey um, from the beginning. Um, uh, Network Rail through and through has been part of, uh, you must have joined around two years after me, I think. 2011. 2011 um, and has seen not only electrification but also signalling telecoms and PLCs for level crossings I learned today. So Daniel please. Yes, if I'm speaking first. Already been asked this evening how technical the talk will be. Richard is going to be more technical than I am. I wanted to cover off the network rail side of it. Network rail a lot more about why do we do this? How does this help our passengers? How does this help us make things um, simpler, better, and greener? And there you go, it's up in the top right. Uh, I'm just going to figure out how to move slides. Um, definitely nothing too simple going on here. Um, so I've moved slides here. I can't make this work. Slides are changing to on screen. But oh, they are. No, no, not changing on screen. We can see. Okay. If you want to carry on, I'll try and get it to um, working in the background. The, the, the bottom of it says presenter. That might be the. Uh... Thank you, Josh. Oh, was it? Was, <laughs> it, was it there and it's vanished? Oh, there you go. There what have you did there? That worked. Look, we'll, we'll, there, there. Thank you very much. Right. So, Daniel, Network Rail and how this makes it better for passengers, better, simpler, greener, because we spent we spent quite a few million pounds on some new protection equipment, some additional power, and some power electronics, some static frequency converters here on the East Coast mainline since about 2015, since the last 12 years or so. And um, it's not clear to a lot of people why that is, why we've actually bothered to invest in this new technology. Um, I've just put it under these, this catchphrase, I think it is, it's about a couple of weeks old at Network Rail, but I'm sure you'll grow familiar with it before long. So I've put the main points about power electronics under simpler, how it makes our relationship with our grid customers simpler, better, how we um, deliver more power to the trains and waste less energy, which is good for our passengers and freight users, and greener. And that's a little bit more about the whole national move to decarbonization of our power grid as we uh, introduce more green technology and, and we uh, enter a place where uh, we have to put a lot more technology into how we supply, how we meet um, the demand and have supply from a lot of different green and renewable sources rather than a few big chunky coal power stations like we might have done uh, when the East Coast was electrified 20 or so years ago. So first, um, going to talk about uh, simpler for grid. So it's so a little bit different to what's on the slide there, but we won't worry about that. Um, the slide that I had uh, said um, that it's simpler to grid because we're a standard customer and uh, because we um, connect in a way. Here, I'll go and find the actual slide. We can connect like renewable energy and we can connect where there is capacity. So we've not been standard customers for the public power grid ever since we started electrifying railways. We cause massive amounts of unbalance for them. We take off one phase, they supply it three phases. We put our return current through their uh, system. They like balance. They like to have phase and phase current. They don't like to have return. 
and that's reflected in our standards and our processes with GRID. We've got a 129 page document just for railways that covers off how we work with our dist distribution companies. And we've got an additional 169 page document called NSI 26 that's just for how we work with National Grid at our uh, sites at 400 kV. And we've got fewer than 10 people in the entire country who are actually competent to execute those NSI 26 instructions and, and deliver um, isolations for us. So that gives you an idea about how non-standard we are. Um, but uh, I, I, maybe you think, why does that matter? Why does it matter that we're a non-standard customer? Well, it matters when we want to connect more power. And that's the situation we were in about 12 years ago on the East Coast. We just ordered a brand new train fleet moving away from loco hold electric locos that have served very well since the original electrification, moving to multiple unit, bimo multiple units, which basically doubled the number of electric services we had on the East Coast. Trains that were running diesel all the way up to Edinburgh were now running electric. We had Thameslink coming in with uh, greater train frequencies and greater train lengths. We had trains coming across the Pennines that were then gonna be able to run from York and up to Newcastle uh, with additional power demand. We had a whole bunch of open access operators who all wanted to use the electric for their cheaper, quicker trains to get to places as exotic as uh, Hull, Morpeth, and uh, even um, Sunderland, I think was one of the options, or is one of the options if you travel on Grand Central. So, so that was a bit of a challenge. It's a great challenge. That's more people wanting to use our railway. Um, that's more services for passengers. It's less diesel burned. It's less wear on the track of the trains are lighter and it's all unlocked by supplying more power. Uh, but being a non-standard customer, really limited where we could connect and limits to this day, where we can connect to get that additional power. Um, our existing supply points, when we go and uh, talk to the operators, they, they often say to us, uh, we, um, we can actually only offer you less power than you currently got here. Uh, so we need to turn to technology to help us to, uh, solve that problem and that's where power electronics and static frequency converters come in because they allow us to control those harmonics i mentioned at the start um, there's no return current they allow us to make a balanced three-phase connection to the grid we look an awful lot more just like a bog standard industrial customer we could even connect at 33 kv so in terms of power networks um, you run up from 11 kv to around 400 kv Every time you increase in voltage, you increase cost, you increase complexity. 33 kV is where a lot of industrial customers connect. If you can connect there, you're going to be paying less money than if you're at 400 kV. So that's how static frequency converters help us to improve our relationship with the overall grid. Now move on to uh, that's simpler. Now move on to better slide that's up, better for passengers and freight. And starting with the better for passengers and freight, I start with something that's a bit particular to the East Coast main line and the way it was electrified. Uh, we've electrified quite a few main lines over quite a few years in this country. I'm not sure what the first one was, but there, there was definitely a significant effort on the Great Eastern main line in the 1950s. And that was electrified. They had some problems with the, um, and, and continue to have problems for a long time with uh, the amounts of uh, sagging and heat that they then. Um, learned from there to limit train speed there and they learned from that when they went and electrified the west coast main line going out from Houston up to Crewe and for that one the particular challenge they faced is British Rail actually had to commission a report to look at the world supply the world output of copper to make sure that the amount of copper they were purchasing to undertake that program wouldn't actually alter the worldwide price of copper so that was the 60s then in the late 70s and into the 80s, it was the turn of the East Coast. And the real focus for the East Coast was to build on what had been learned in the past and to um, do things with less steel, less copper and less concrete, to use new computer modeling, design software, to push OLE to, to, to understand the limits of what OLE could do and uh, to deliver a more efficient design. But there's some compromises uh, from that more efficient design. Um, one of those compromises is that uh, where the older, heavier systems can take uh, a bit more current, a bit more energy when there's a fault, our uh, improved and 
lightweight system, current, it's a current that flows, uh, tends to cause arcing, it causes stranding of conductors, it causes dewirements. And when it does cause a dewirement on the East Coast main line, uh, the effect is felt across more tracks for longer uh, because of the way that particularly our four track areas are um, set up. We have head spans. So uh, when you have uh, one wire break, it actually it has a sort of a tension, it has an effect on neighboring lines. Um, so when we came to deliver more power to the East Coast main line, we knew that we had um, to make sure that we didn't compromise reliability. If we're going to be putting more electric services through, uh, we, we didn't want to have uh, more passengers stationary on more trains for longer. So we knew we had to limit the amount of energy that went through. And that is something that uh, we've limited by setting the, the amount of energy, that, the amount of fault current that can flow in a fault and the duration which it can flow for. And that's something that a combination of an improved protection and control system, so new relays in the substations rolled up all the way through the East Coast and building on top of that static frequency converters, which can control the flow of voltage and current, both give us. So that's how they remove damaging energy from faults. But more than that, they help us regulate voltage. I've just pulled off. Um, this is some data from February, just from a month ago, and it's actually from York. And so what we've got there at the top there is uh, measured voltages from our new SFC at, at Hamilton. And what we've got on the blue line here is our existing supply at York. Uh, on the x-axis is time. Uh, this is midnight one day. This little bump up, that's midnight the next. And what you can see is that at our ordinary uh, transformer connections, we get uh, the voltage that's on the grid and the voltage that's at the grid on the grid actually varies through the day. Um, there's less load at night in the whole country and that tends, that means the voltage rises overnight. So that's where you see that dip that sort of, we don't regulate that, the, the voltage, we just, uh, the, the grid regulates it, we pass it on to the trains and that's 275 kV connections, so that's a pretty high one. What we've got here is what we're seeing from Hamilton at the minute, which is a regulated supply. We've got power electronics controlling the voltage. So where a train in York Station would have had 25 and a half kV, it's now seeing 27 and a half kV, two kV extra. That either means that to get power, power is current times voltage, it's drawing less current, so it's less heat lost, less inefficiency, or it means your train is moving a little bit quicker out of York Station because it's getting a little bit of an extra ump to get some more power because we're getting a better voltage profile. So. That's how we're improving things for passengers at the moment. I don't think there's any electric freight going through York Station yet, but I'm confident people will want to do that at some point in the future. Simpler, better, the last one, and then it's Richard, greener. For greener, this is a quote from Australia, because we weren't actually the first people in the UK here to figure out that power electronics is uh, solution that can help us be part of our green toolbox for rail. That was actually the Australians. And, and we weren't even the first to figure out that power electronics could help us on our own type of OLE. That was again, the Australians. Um, this guy in Queensland, he's their, he's their chief m &E engineer. He's written a few papers and, and I, I thought this was good. It, written in 2018, so forgive his use of the word unprecedented, which was far less cliche in 2018 than it is in 2023. Uh, but there we have, out of all the technologies emerging during the 20th century, the field of power electronics is set to have an unprecedented impact on our lives in this century. So what did he mean there in Australia and here in the UK? Well, really, fundamentally, he's talking about our power grid. So in the 21st century, the grid is going to power more of our cars, electric cars. It's going to power more of our buses, trains. It's going to heat more of our homes going to run more of our AI powered data centers and the energy to do this it's going to come from more sources it's going to come from wind from solar from wood chips from nuclear from all these different sources at different times and that is harder to coordinate than today's grid that's harder to control so the grid is going through a big change a significant change and we've got to be aware of that so we've not to turn to grid and, and say well we that used to be this way we used to be able to get this we've got to understand how their world is changing and how we need to match our demand. We are one of the biggest 
consumers of electricity in the UK. We need to um, be understanding the change they're going through and um, presenting solutions and working with them. And Power Electronics is part of that toolbox there. It's not just static frequency converters. There is a whole a whole raft of different um, options that you can put on in different sizes, different places. Um, so that's where it fits into greener. So I've taken up enough of your time and um, I'm sure Richard's will run a lot smoother with the slides, but I'll hand over now to Richard to take a far um, deeper look at the particular technology that's been rolled out on the East Coast main line for the power supply upgrade. I think. And then there will be questions. Thank you, Dan. OK. So I'm going to attempt in about 40 minutes to cover why this was done with a little bit of a history. But you're going to have to forgive me. I'm trying to squeeze about eight years of history into two or three minutes. So um, it will be a, a, a rattle through there. But why did we fundamentally take a risk? Why did we do something that hadn't been done in the UK before? It's not the way to an easy life. It's not the, the easy option as a uh, as a region or as a um, as an engineer. And speaking personally, I'm a bit of a Luddite. So I like doing things to be proven. I've seen lots of innovations on railway that promised the world and um, didn't necessarily deliver. So it took quite a bit of um, challenge to, to kind of say this is the right thing to do and we should do something different and a lot of effort to persuade other people um, in the industry but it was the right thing to do before we got permission to do it. We'll talk about what the technology is, we'll talk a bit about uh, building it and for that I'm going to invite up actually uh, Safia uh, who was far closer to the building of it than I was. Um, Saf also uh, was involved in the building of the first 25 kV SFC in Australia. Quite how he moved from Bondi Beach to uh, Hamilton, I'm not quite <laughs> sure, uh, but we managed to bring him in to, to support with the uh, quite different SFC at Hamilton. And a little bit about the difference it makes to the wider railway. So first thing I'll share, this is a uh, effectively a major feeding diagram, which I dredged up from about um, 2009. And if you turn this on its side and lay it there, it would pretty much look like Great Western electrification in terms of sectioning, in terms of rationalised feeding, in terms of number of supply sites. It pretty much was uh, Great Western electrification. The very earliest plans would have gone from 19 feeder stations we have today broadly located at railway junctions and turn back points and places where they're operationally useful to six in the future. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of substations, mainly in the north actually, because they're already quite close together in the south, uh, but in the north we'd have seen quite a lot more uh, substations by the side of the railway and getting on for 1200 kilometres of new uh, live overhead line to be installed, plus the structure reinforcements and uh, all the good things that go with that. So why didn't we do that? Um, it was a bit of a journey, to be honest, and uh, involved some lessons learned from what was emerging from the cost and program challenges on Great Western Electrification and also on uh, the first phase of uh, PSU. We like to talk about PSU 1, PSU 2. Um, if it was a film, it would have return of fee, but it's actually quite different in technology choice. Um, PSU 2. And that's partly from some of the lessons learned from PSU 1, some of the hard lessons actually in the difficulty and cost of installing the infrastructure for auto transformer feeding, which I'm reliably informed is due to go live uh, this year, um, nearly a decade after the start. That's a 30 kilometre bit, which cost uh, uh, getting on for as much as the other 100 and something kilometres, which didn't use AT. Um, we had this challenge that the power grid was changing and this was a bit of a shock because um, agreements had been made with distribution network operators to say we're going to have a bit more power in certain locations. And then a few years later, we're finding that actually we're no longer compliant from uh, harmonics and negative phase sequence, which we'll talk about in a moment. And that was partly because our loads were growing faster than expected. This was originally remitted for a somewhat smaller train service. Um, which was basically to re replace the HSTs, uh, for those who remember them, on East Coast. 
and became a much bigger timetable upgrade. But it was also because the way in which the railway spreads its power quality pollution into the grid is dissipated by big rotating machines. And they all take a bit of a hit in terms of efficiency and lifespan. But as long as it's shared out amongst enough of them, none of them individually take too much of a hit, but it's unacceptable. And there's a, there's a standard which tells you how much of a hit is acceptable. Problem is that the grid was changing and those big rotating machines were being replaced by power electronics, both in industry and in generators. And that changed the picture. And actually, even on the super grid supplies going on, going in, we were starting to see capacity constraints, even at 400 kV, where previously, historically, people didn't even bother doing power quality studies on them because it was just expected that it would be fine. Um, affordability program with challenges. Um, but also we had somebody called Phil Verster that some people might remember, um, who was a, a fairly demanding taskmaster. Uh, and he had very high expectations for a change in overhead line reliability. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the lessons learned preceding the power supply upgrade, which fed into it. Um, we went around the world and looked at how other railways do electrification. And we came away saying, actually, there's lots of good practice, which had been built up through continuous improvement over decades. And we brought some of that back with us. We then modelled it using a modelling software which can consider all traction power technologies, um, which hasn't historically been possible. Um, and there was a, a sifting process with stakeholders from across capital delivery nationwide, um, the headquarters team, lots of people were involved in, uh, in challenging and ended up with a single option being selected at GRIP3. Um, so what did it deliver at that point? Well, the, Aim was it would have more capacity. It would support what was then the ITSS 2020, not quite been introduced yet in 2024, but <coughs> it would support the ITSS 2020 rather than the 2018 IEP timetable, which was itself an uplift from the 2015 IEP capacity timetable, which we were originally remitted on. It had more resilience, um, more strategically located supplies. Um, we were looking at how we could reduce overhead line failures with upgraded protection. It also moved a programme that would have involved closing the East Coast main line every weekend for a very long number of years to uh, modify the overhead line into something which was much more high street environment, ground level construction. And as part of the development, we actually modelled right through to 2040, electrification of every single branch on the route, even the Settling Carlisle, even the Sunderland branch down. Um, modelled with electric trains running and demonstrated there'd be no abortive spend. So you could incrementally continue to upgrade based on this technology path. And that was something we had identified as a challenge for the original design, but it was a big bang spend. It gave you a capacity, but there wasn't a next step for it. There was no way to then add further capacity um, on that path. And this was the end point. So we're talking today mainly about Hamilton SFC, which is here, a um, very deliberate choice of location. Um, it was there for operability and maintainability reasons for the railway. It gives us the ability to work around failures, either on the direct route to Leeds, um, on the route into York, and means the isolations on one route are not dependent on taking an isolation of the other route at the same time. It sounds obvious, but that would have not been possible with the previous design. Um, so a little bit of a diversion um, about this. I'll go fairly quickly because uh, Dan's covered some of this already. But this was the original British Rail model for how to electrify a railway. And it worked really well. You chose strategic sites 40 kilometres apart um, to put a transformer derived power supply in. You connect that to the 132 kV network. And because the railways were built to serve industrial centres, they were built right into the, uh, the city centres. The key junctions, the key nodes where we want power supplies also had 132 kV available because the railway was built for industry and so was the distribution network. 
In between these feeding areas, due to this inconvenient issue of the fact we only have one wire over the track, we have to have a midpoint with a neutral section. And that's been the accepted practice in 25 kV railways for the last 60 years since the French first did it, or the Germans, but the French got it at the end of World War II. So this is an example feeder station, this is Durham, and you'll see here we take the transformer and we connect it to two of the wires on the um, pylon coming in. And that's because we're a single phase load, we can only connect to two wires for the transformer. <coughs> so if you imagine the voltage in the grid is a little bit like a stool with three legs, we're going to shave off some of the voltage actually on two of these legs but you'll forgive me the artistic license and the result is the stool doesn't quite sit as um, vertical electrically a similar thing is happening the voltage in the uh, free wires is not the same so the current in the free wires is not the same and because of that current is forced through the neutral which does damage to um, electrical equipment it also damages the efficiency of the grid so there are limits in how much you're allowed to do it to keep it acceptable. Um, Dan's already talked about the phase out of coal fired power station and one of the effects it's had on some of our legacy supplies and some of our new supplies um, and the, the converse, the growth in power electronic derived uh, generation. So just to put that into context for Hamilton, this map is a bit busy, so forgive me if I kind of uh, go through the colours. The purple are the supergrid lines, 400 kV lines, and you can see there's about six 400 kV substations on there, they're the purple dots. The brown is 132 kV, and one of the notable difference, dis, differences is that the 400 kV lines were built after the war and generally avoided centres of population, whereas the 132 kV network was uh, built for the industry in the centres of the population and maybe when people didn't worry so much about um, going straight into the middle of towns. We have three feeder stations shown here. So we have the grey lines. This is the East Coast main line running <coughs> up through Doncaster, past Templehurst Junction, Hamilton Junction, up into Colton Junction. And this is the Leeds to Selby line. And we had a convenient 132 kb point of connection there. It actually did involve the DNO putting a, uh, a new substation in, partly because we needed to underground the overhead line to route clear to make space for the overhead line of the Transpennine electrification to fit through. Ravensport, again, strategically chosen for, based on the operations consultation. So it sits right in a railway triangle with a junction between the Transpennine route and a route soon to be electrified and not a million miles away from another junction heading off somewhere up here, sorry, I can't see the towns, uh, but a second route into Manchester. Last but not least, you've got the only one of these substations at 400 kV, which comes near the railway, and that's the one at Hayrod that's already been built. The upshot is we've got so much choice of good connection points if we can use those 132 kV supplies that the way in which we design the electrification system changes. When before it was about where can you take the power? And you can see on that previous map how few places um, uh, were practical. It became, and then the natural implication being, how big do you need to build your overhead line to push that power all the way along to the midpoint until you can get to the next supply area? It changes, it becomes actually what's most operable, maintainable railway? What's the lowest losses railway? What's the most elegant system solution? If you no longer have to build your overhead line in one way to be able to feed power for extremely long distances, what's the best overhead line for cost, maintenance, isolations, impact on other disciplines? So I've, I've mixed up my slides order here because I've already talked about this. Um, if you have very long distances between your supply points, because for all those power quality issues we've talked about, the harmonics and the negative phase sequence, we've had to go up to 400 kV, where there's very few supply points available, you need a way to push that power further down the railway. 
And one way of doing that is using an auto transformer system where we put another set of electrical conductors in the air, um, effectively reinforcing the power supply like a, a, a parallel distribution line, sharing out the current between twice the number of conductors. Converter feeding looks different. Um, they, there are exceptions. So converters are used widely in Central Europe, increasingly in new high speed railways and other railways that are being built around the world. There are a couple of exceptions which combine um, converters with auto transformer feeding, but they are places like Saudi Arabia with massive distances of desert that have got to be bridged between power supplies. Um, by and large, you see very simple overhead line used with converter um, fed railways. The other difference you see in here is what's missing. The midpoint is no longer needed and the neutral section is no longer needed. So how can we do that? Well, a static frequency converter is a piece of power electronics which allows you to take three wires in and feed one wire out. It takes three phase power in um, and allows you to, to feed a single phase railway with a balanced load. But it does a bit of magic in between. It's like there's a split down the middle. So trains draw things that the grid don't like. They draw a lot of reactive power, which means that the current is not drawn in phase with the voltage, and that affects the efficiency of the grid. They draw harmonic currents, which again impact the grid. The static frequency converter segregates the railway system from the three-phase public grid. And that is how we can connect in at lower voltage um, power supplies. But it also means we're no longer drawing some of these currents from the grid. So where you've got a, a, a 40 MVA supply today, it may be a 39 MVA SFC would feed the same trains because we're no longer drawing the harmonic currents and the uh, reactive power, which also uh, heats, the, heats the system. Um, Second generation SFCs, um, the Potter car uh, looks like this. It looks smoother when it comes out the other end because it has a filter um, to make it look smoother. But that's basically a principle. It's pulse width modulated with some fire resistors which fire a certain number of times per second to create a, a sine wave. Hamilton Junction is slightly different. People like to say, and you'll see some press releases saying it's the first multi-level modular 25 kV SFC in the world. It's actually not. Um, so uh, Wildenrath in Germany, which the test loop uh, got there first. Um, but the people who write press releases don't seem to have noticed that one. Um, we have chains of IGBTs. IGBTs are simply faster switching, more efficient, more modern versions of thyristors. And so for Hamilton Junction, you've got 24 uh, IGBTs, 24 capacitors all in one long chain. Each capacitor can be switched in or out every 16.7 microseconds. And by adding them up in different uh, combinations, you can create any voltage you want as a difference between the start of the chain and the end of the chain. So by constantly switching in different capacitors, you can simulate a very neat 25 kV sine wave, a lot neater than that. <coughs> Um, so multi-level modular also means we've moved away from custom equipment of second generation converters. The modules you see in Hambleton are exactly the same as the modules you'll see down the road towards Hull, going in for Viking Link project, uh, the HVDC project and many other projects. Um, and the scale of what we're doing is tiny compared to if anyone drives down the A1079 out to Hull, their converter hall is enormous and they have literally hundreds and hundreds of these modules in series. They are, well, let's do a bit of a comparison first of all. So this is the smallest conventional feeder station I could find. It's a beautiful example of British rail engineering, absolutely built down to the penny. So the Scottish power compound, um, which doesn't even have a circuit breaker in it, is literally just a wooden pole route fed onto a transformer, fed directly onto the, the railway switch gear. Um, absolutely beautiful design. Um, and you would have every 15 to 20 kilometres, 
a sectioning substation to allow your protection to work effectively and share current between lines. Hamilton Junction, which is the biggest end of SFCs, um, is the biggest one in the world feeding uh, 25 kV railway. Come back to that later. So the grid substation here, there's two SFC blocks, each roughly 80 MVA in rating. That's an instantaneous rating. The continuous rating is a little bit lower. And then the 25 kV switch gear. So of the order of 60 meters by 60 meters. Picking up the, the reference design we started from, this is just the switch gear from an AT Fed railway. This is Didcot ATFS to the same scale. And if I put the, um, the transformer site on it, I can't fit it on the screen. I couldn't fit it on this wall. Um, this isn't all for the railway, but this block here is one transformer feed of a railway and it's associated switching equipment. And we start to see the reasons why these connections are so expensive. But just skipping back to here, it's not just one of these. We then need the auto transformers every 10 to 12 kilometers along the railway, typically. Um, so you have another one of these, a little bit smaller because they tend to use rationalized feeding. So you're off the order of, of that length of site every 10 to 12 kilometers instead of one of our tin huts of East Coast practice every 15 to 20 kilometers. So more substations and a lot bigger. That sounds like it's not a big thing, but actually when we looked at PSU1, just the cost of the land purchase, the cabling to places you could buy land, the roads to places where you could buy land to fit the AT substations in was actually a major driver of the, um, uh, the uh, what would have been the AT cost. And you get into cycles in traction power design. So the trains are responding to the power supply and the power supply is responding to the trains. Daniel showed you a, a measured data extract from York, and that was the voltage fed from Hambleton 30 kilometers along the railway. So that's the minimum voltage fed from Hambleton. It was the maximum voltage fed from York feeder station, the conventional supply. That then drops over the, the length of railway. Now, what's interesting about conventional supplies is this line is curved. So as you your voltage drops, the trains need more current to get the same power. But that means the voltage drops further. So that means the trains need more current, which means the voltage drops further, which means the trains need more current. And if you continue this graph on, and this is a 12 kA limited transformer, so this is as, as good as you can get out of um, uh, transformers of this. As that voltage comes on, it actually reaches a theoretical point where it just collapses like a stone. And you try and feed too far, um, your voltage goes down to zero and the system becomes unstable. This is a conventional SFC, as you find all around the world. And it looks like that, not because SFCs have to look like that, but because they were the history, they were used to replace rotating converters. And rotating converters look like that. And if you made your SFC into something that was really strong as a power supply, it would grab all the load off the rotating converter and start trying to push the rotating converter around instead of sharing that demand nicely. And even when all the rotating converters are gone, there was then 30 years of static frequency converters built in this way. So your new static frequency converters had to match up to the old static frequency converters. So even in Australia, even in Pottery Car, they follow this same approach because that's what the market has had to deliver for Central Europe because of the history of where they've been installed. Hamilton does something different. The UK doesn't have a history of rotating converters, not unless you're feeling really old and you want to look at DC railways. The UK is starting from a blank sheet of paper. So actually Hamilton starts off slightly below 27.5 kV and ramps up its voltage and then sits at 27.5 kV up to 80 megawatts, well, 75 megawatts is nameplate rating. And that's a virtuous cycle because then the trains draw less current. And if the trains are drawing less current, then your voltages of the train are better. Not only that, you're burning less energy as heat in the overhead line, which means your overhead line doesn't expand as much, which means you don't get things like catenary clash and problems with tension lengths as soon which means the capacity of your overhead line goes up. 
and the trains don't burn as much heat in their transformers because the current going through the transformer is less. So the energy losses on the train are lower, which means they draw less current. And the virtuous cycle continues. To extend that, this is a simulation of a pretty intensive um, uh, railway timetable. And it shows the voltage at the train. Voltage at train is good. It means the train is more efficient, it accelerates faster, you have a more reliable um, lower loss railway. This is your traditional feeding style we talked about before. It's got these little drop drops. Those are the booster transformers that have their own impedance. So as the train goes through a midpoint connector, goes past a midpoint connector, it switches in another load of um, impedance. AT feeding was introduced to allow you to feed longer distances. So you can see here, feeding up to a midpoint, feeding up to a midpoint. This is Hambleton style SFC feeding, this dotted line here, feeding up to a midpoint. Now, this diagram is a bit misleading. This kind of thinks about the way we used to think as traction power designers. The job of the traction power designer, as it was described to me when I first did it, was work out where you can get a 400 kV grid supply point and then work out how far you can push that power to try and use the capacity of that transformer. Because if it's going to cost you that number of tens of millions of pounds to get a grid supply point, you want to use it, was the thinking. It's an odd thinking because the overhead line is far more expensive than the power supply. But that was the thinking. If you've got SFCs where you can take power wherever you need them, actually, why would you push the power as far as you can? Why would you not have a more efficient railway and a more reliable railway where when you take isolations, you're not waiting for the last train to clear a 60 kilometre section. But when the red lights of that train go through your work site, you can start putting your earths up. And by the way, we've got half as many earths to put up because we've got half as many live conductors in the air. It's all a knock on. And when you're operating high output track renewals fleet, as Ben will uh, remember and testify, every minute you lose out of that possession in a seven hour window is yards lost of production. And ultimately, it's hundreds of thousands of pounds a week. OK, can I hand over to Saf, who actually has far more to do with building it than I do. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> um, yes, as Richard introduced, uh, my name is Satya Naka. I've been in Siemens seven years, uh, but 15 years in the right way. I used to work in Australia with uh, Trevor Dagno, who, who referenced him earlier. Um, so I was the uh, CRE for design um, of the SFC design at Hamilton. I later was involved with construction and commissioning of Hamilton. So that's a, a 3D render of um, Hamilton that we generated um, during the design stage. And we'll see some photos um, later on that um, hopefully will reflect um, what's, what's, on this, what's on this slide. I get to play some videos, actually. I have, I have the fun bit. Um, so hopefully um, we will we will start by the case for Hamilton. We, um, Daniel explained it really well already, uh, tying it with natural rail team. Richard also explained it already. But um, from a feeding diagram perspective, if, um, if uh, this is what Ham uh, East Coast Mainline used to, used to look like before Hamilton was, in, was introduced, the colours here denote uh, different feeding um, points from the grid. The red, for example, is the dark yellow and light yellow, the two different supply points. Potter car, we talked about already, it is an SFC side. Potter car feeds from Bawtree neutrals to Doncaster neutrals. And York feeder station, oh, sorry, the, the Doncaster feeds from uh, Doncaster its own neutrals up to Hamilton neutrals, and York is to feed north and south. <clears throat> so when we looked at the new timetable, the modeling that, that um, Richard talked about earlier, we looked at where can we get uh, uh, more power from. Doncaster, unfortunately when we went to Doncaster, uh, there wasn't much supply left, and they, they, it's actually struggling with NPS at the moment, um, as it is. Uh, York is all 275 kV grid supply point, but Daniel showed us the graph there already, and we know that York voltage regulation is not as good as it, as it can be. And it's only going to get worse with the new timetable being, being introduced. So we did the traction power modeling that Richard talked about already, looked at many scenarios, and we looked at um, the new feeding arrangement, which is what current East Coast mainline looks like on the right-hand side. So we, we relieved Doncaster. Doncaster is, will, will no longer be 
um, is actually on, it currently is no longer a feeder station. It will be decommissioned into an MPTSC. Transformers are uh, out of service or not in use. Um, Hamilton, the new green colors. Hamilton feeds north to York neutral section and south to Doncaster neutrals. York, um, although there's two transformers available at York, uh, we are relieving York from its supply because it can't sustain the new timetable. Um, so we introduced Hamilton is going to change what well, has changed from it, MPTSD to a feeder station. Feeder station is shown by a square box and TSC as a circle. Um, when Hamilton was designed, as Richard already talked about earlier, it's in it's an ideal location being at a junction between East Bush Mill Line and Transpennine um, going east, east to west. So Hamilton was designed to also feed the Transpennine lines for its full electrification option. It was rated uh, for the full timetable of Transpennine as well as um, East Bush Mill Line. Um, and then you can see some gaps in the in the network and even currently there are plans for future uh, future power supplies to be introduced to to um to uh to fill in those gaps and hopefully pretty soon we'll be able to take an electric train from manchester all the way through to york hamilton at the moment only feeds the east coast main line but the tiu project comes along they will incrementally um, um extend hamilton's feeding area Hamilton will feed up to Micklefield, which will be new, new MPTSC to be located at that point. So Hamilton, as it's currently feeding, uh, will be extended. Um, only by middle of this year, uh, it will be extended to Micklefield. Um, so we looked at um, uh, Richard showed earlier about the grid connection point, the subgrid sub -grid connection points. This is Hamilton located um, roughly there, at the south of York and north of Doncaster. This is from 2019, um, when we went to the DNO, uh, again, sorry, before for context, this is the Transpennine line east to west, and the East Coast Main line um, north to south, south to north. Um, so before we started our construction works, um, this is what it should look like, the existing MPTSC, is that white box there, tin hut, which will no one love. There used to be an existing one third of KV line. That's the one third of KV pylon. It used to oversail the Transpennine line, another pylon in the middle of the farmer's field, and a pylon on the other side of the East Coast main line. So, ideally, ideal location for a new feeder station. But when we went to the grid and proposed the SFC, they were overjoyed. Well, the power grid very, were very amenable because we no, longer, we no longer have the problems we used to have with the unbalanced load negative phase sequence to their network. So they're quite willing to work with us um, to, to, um, to progress the connection application. <clears throat> so we, we had to obviously need to um, get rid of the uh, one third KV line that, that, that we need the space for, uh, for our new compound. So the next picture is <coughs> as of uh, probably middle of last year from Google Maps. So it's, um, it's quite quite old, but, but it's during construction stage. So we diverted the 130 KV line uh, as an underground, under track crossing, under the Transpennine line, and then also under the East Coast Mail line, under the under the under track crossing. Diverted the 130 KV lines, the DNO and PG have built their own substation, which is that uh, square compound there. And we built our two SSAs adjacent to the DNO substation. And our new feeder station is that long building there, um, which is replacing the MPTSC, which will be uh, decommissioned uh, shortly. So that's that's what we were able to um, uh, build in the last um, uh, two or three years or so. Um, Um, may just uh, turn this volume down, is it? Uh, what's it done? Just going back. Mm. 
Yeah, so um, as you can see here, uh, we also built a new haul road for delivery. That, that road didn't exist to uh, the farmer for a temporary, temporary, um, um, temporary land acquisition and to build a haul road. There's a lot of this moving uh, by to, to bring the site to, to, um, to its um, ground level. So the Dino combo is substantially complete at this stage. Um, this is the building we, we, uh, we are at. Appear on the ground works the derby of the 25 kV building. And I'll move this in place there. Open to the 25 kV building. Me. So that are the first foundations of the SSC going in. That was uh, 2022 January time, um, was then the first foundations that uh, went in for the building um, of the SSC. There's a stop. Mm, so that's the 25 KV, it's, it's quite a long, Building, you probably just about saw that um, it's actually in two pieces and had to be stitched together at site. So these, these are um, <clears throat> is a modern type of construction where they are built off site in a factory environment and um, tested, pre tested in the factory and brought on site and then assembled together depending on the length of the building. We were going up to the building, uh, it moved quite rapidly uh, from the line. So when I said earlier about the first um, foundation going in, that's the first building um, fully fully uh, cladded up, uh, except for the doors, substantially complete um, from a structural perspective. Building roof going on, firewall and form of uh, bonding um, going in there. Equipment outdoor, equipment outdoor switch, switch yard being built. Um, and being erected now, as you can see, transformers being being uh, being delivered. So we, yeah, so um, we're we're coming to the end of the construction video. So construction substantially complete was completed by um, uh, a year later. So January twenty twenty three. Um, was when we were able to start pre-commissioning. Um, so within a year was um, was the overall construction time. Um, so uh, that's SFC one um, on the uh, closest closest to us, and SFC two on the on the furthest end. Um, and in here they have incoming feeders and track track feeders uh, as well. Um, slide. Uh, need you help us with that one book. That's quite short. Right. You carry on. Book. No, actually, we've got the next slide. So we we uh, haven't been all smooth sailing. Uh, we have had a few few challenges. So um, we we have to go through quite a few. Uh, be being first of a type, um, we we um, we require approval, uh, which 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 is um, which is bread and butter network rail uh, requirements. So we have to have what we call um, rail reliability study. Uh, we have to satisfy the chief engineer in Network Rail that we were ready for the ready, ready, ready for the market, ready for Network Rail. It's a separate, it's a separate lot, and six criteria, and we we needed that to to as a stage gate between group uh, three to four. So back done back in 2017, then we presented to the chief engineer in uh, Milton Keynes. Product acceptance throughout the project from group three onwards, really, when we had the requirements set out to us um, up to up to 2020. Oh, now we have a trial, trial certificate issue too, which is just what's shown on the screen. ORR, of course, they gave us authorization um, to 
to, to energize. Uh, so we have to submit a lot of evidence to the technical authority and to the um, NOBOs and ESBOs. Um, we, we also had some other challenges we didn't plan for. COVID. We started design in 2020, um, Drift 5 design, and COVID hit. We, for, we've seen the complexity of the construction already. The design was even more complicated. At something like 800 deliverables across multiple disciplines, civil, electrical, um, high voltage, low voltage, protection control with the new, not just SFC, but everything else is new as well. We had introduced new protection relays, um, geo redundancy within the relays as well. So to do all of that over teams was just a nightmare. And uh, I wouldn't want to do it again for for uh, for uh, for any other site. And trying to keep all of the different partners moving forward within the alliance environment was was um, was was a nightmare. So we we, we spent many many teams and trying to do IDCs for designs and trying to get design reviews done um, it was not easy. Of course, then we had Brexit. So we had that affects our most of our equipment is off the shelf, which we which we assemble on site. And we, and we prefer it that way because because off the shelf equipment is is is, is readily available uh, rather than bespoke custom customized equipment. The Brexit hit it affected our customs. We, we we when we had time it affected our program. Uh, we also had the Ukraine war conflict and that, that changed commodity commodity prices quite a lot. When we are working with a fixed price environment, uh, it it changed change change changes your numbers. Um, but we have a we have a remit to deliver as well. We of course had some site site issues as well. That's actually probably saw it in the video earlier. We once um, had a a pool, a swimming pool as we like to call it. Somebody went and thought we should put um, a um, a safety boy outside it. <laughs> a, 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 um, um, but we, we well, that was like that for about two months before we could find a resolution in design to to uh, to um, to to overcome that. So. We now have another video, which was uh, a drone video um, created during the construction stage. That's the DNO compound um, that we're showing this MPG. We did the foundation works for them, or, 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 the, or the formation work, I should say. The DNO have built their compound. But we had to interface with them. We, had to, we, we were within the line, we were into the contractor, the overall compound. Um, so we had to liaise with them. To the surface, as you can see here. Um, I'll show short of time, so I'll probably skip through this, but I'll let this play um, play through. Uh, this gives me a scale of scale of things with, uh, with people moving in the background. I don't know if many of you have, some of you have been to Hamilton, um, or some of you have. Um, maybe in the future we should be able to do some um, with it. Um, These are what we call ACO reactors. They have magnetic clearance around them. We have to make sure that the compound fencing or the fencing was was uh, was outside that. We are working with tools. They're on very tight, tight, tight space. Um, the um, when we purchased the land from the farmer, we were constrained in our in our purchase boundaries that dictated the and that put a constraint on our on our on our on our on our design. Okay. Uh, uh, how do you go forward, Richard? If you to carry on. Yes. Um, I, I'll I'll jump in here and just uh, I'm conscious some people have got an IRSC dinner to get to. So I'm going to be as quick as I can um, on the rest of it. And this is live data from Hamilton. Um, sorry for the uh, quality of the picture. But you can see some trains running along the East Coast Main Line fed by Hamilton Junction. Over here, you can see the 132 kV voltages, they're actually not in phase with each other. We come off two different grid supply points. Uh, one's off Ferry Bridge, one off Osbaldwick. They've got about uh, between two and six degrees difference, Michael told me today, um, between them. And here you see a bit of train load and you can see the dirty waveform that trains uh, create. The difference you would normally see in a railway traction power supply, you see that same shape on the grid voltage as well. You see it pass directly through. But as you see here, the grid voltage remains pretty much the same. 
even while the railway voltage, you've got a, a combination of uh, harmonics and the fire resistor uh, controlled train together um, at that point, and the grid voltages are remaining compliant. The good news is that means when you put more trains on or you put different trains on the route, you don't then have to go and redo your traction power. And I'm going to skip straight past that because we are very close on time. Um, I put this on because it makes me laugh. Uh, you get overhead line failures for all sorts of reasons, but one of the more preventable ones is ones which are due to short circuit. And th I, this makes me laugh because I came into work one morning and we had three dewinements. And by the end of the day, we'd worked out two of them were due to children's balloons. That is a number three birthday balloon. Uh, and that used to be some AWAC holding the catenary in place. So, and I'll, I'll this is not East Coast Main Line. <laughs> this is um, a, a railway where the sensitivity of resistive reach is not quite, uh, quite the same. And you can see here a fault where the protection has been unable to see the short circuit current. And that's got as much to do with the distribution topology, actually, as it has to do with protection relays. So one of the objectives uh, in PSU1 and PSU2 was to deliver a positive outcome in terms of route reliability. And one of the very early decisions that came from that was to keep a very simple distribution scheme. Each electrical section has one circuit breaker at one end, one circuit breaker at the other, which enables a much greater sensitivity to discriminate between uh, resistive faults and load. And this is a typical short circuit. At the top, you see voltage waveform. At the bottom, you see currents. Typical short circuit you would have seen any time from sort of 2010 onwards. It's substantially better than what you would have seen before 2008. And that's because Eastern Region did a, another upgrade from a previous protection scheme around about 2008 to 2010. And one of the outcomes of that was that the catenary failures on the East Coast Main Line, which were happening roughly once a month, went down to around two a year. That was the type of catenary failure which got nicknamed catenary cancer because no one knew what it was causing it. But it turned out after a lot of forensic testing, the wires were simply melting due to short circuit current, due to heat. And the I squared T gives you a means of reducing that. The protection upgrade improved that. So the sort of figures we were seeing here, we still get dewinements due to short circuits, but not as many as we got before. So how could we make that better? Well, one of the nice things about being able to do a whole power supply upgrade is it could be designed as a system. It wasn't just for power supplies and then come along later and do a distribution design. The distribution design, the protection design and the SFCs were designed in one room, literally in one room. And that means they were integrated. So it's possible for the SFC not only to actively control the current, so we don't get 12,000 amps flowing into the vault, we get a controlled current of about 2,727 amps, give or take about 50. Um, we also can use the uh, power electronics, which are far faster than circuit breakers, to interrupt the current before the circuit breaker has time to open. And although not everything on the protection system is, uh, is enabled today and is commissioned today, the capability is there for the future. The upshot is a 99% reduction in max I squared T compared to the system which would have gone in based on the original design. And that's a 99% reduction in heat for conductors. It does also mean the short circuit test photos far less interesting than when I used to do them. Utterly disappointing that art flash. OK, I'm going to rattle through very quickly because we are past our time. Um, what's left for the future? Well, the first thing for me is we move away from a, a thinking about electrification as how do you get lots of power out from a supply? How do you do mega upgrades? The world changes. Post PSU2, there's no need to do another substantial on track upgrade of the East Coast because any future rising capacity is now an off track greenfield upgrade inject a bit more capacity at a certain location. And when you go to other countries where SFCs are used in parallel, you don't need to do a mega upgrade of one feeding area because you put another 40 megawatt block in, 
and the power ripples out around the surrounding area because the ones next to it are relieved a bit and they relieve the ones next to it a bit. So it becomes a much more incremental. We don't have to reserve so much capacity. At the moment, we reserve capacity so that during an outage, one supply can take on the whole of another supply feeding area. Hamilton is rated, we've got reserve capacity of 42 MVA. But actually, in most days, it's drawing nothing like that. But we have to reserve the capacity because we're an island mode network and we need to be able to cover those outages. Um, the principle carries through for not just the big SFC, the main line, but the small power requirements. If you've got a depot that needs an independent power supply, if you've got battery trains coming and you're worried about the capacity of the uh, existing network to feed it, you can take exactly the same principle, exactly the same technology, but in a much smaller, more packaged um, uh, approach. And as Daniel said, Connecting in at 400 kV is a four to eight year lead time to start the work. Connecting in at 132 kV faster, but 33 kV, and particularly 11 kV, very fast and very cheap, often less than 12 months to get a connection at 11 kV. This is a 12 month from uh, being able to say we need this, the thing starting to arrive on site, and less than 24 months to having it commissioned and in service. Interestingly, you ask the question, what can battery trains do? And it's a completely different uh, presentation, but we ran out of routes to study to find something they couldn't do. With the right power supply, we got them running Highland Main Line, including freight. Um, last but not least, we now have a fully compliant distribution code or grid code compliant connection, not something operating on special favours with the grid which means we can do anything you can do with a conventional connection, like feed in renewable power, be it 100 kilowatts on the roof of the SFC, be it 50 megawatts, although Daniel might beat me up if we put it on the farmer's fields. But the principle is you can connect in directly because it's a standard three phase system and we can connect in behind the meter where it hedges the railway's costs. And I think, Any questions? Dan, uh, Thank you very Dan. Much all three of you. Any questions? I'm going to have to excuse myself because I promised Mrs. Rosday that I would be back at home to put one child to bed. But, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk, and I'm sure Sam and Richard will be able to. Thank you. Any thank questions? You. Anyone in the room? Richard, you're going to hate me asking this one, but it's probably a lot of people left in it. So, David Emerson, I'm going to explain to you for the electrical distribution plan for the Network Rail Eastern. Um, it's about the neutral section or removal. Yeah, now, obviously, the neutral sections form very much a strategic link or strategic gap between different sections for operational reasons and to prevent inadvertent energization to a trade facility. Yep. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you get a row of these, we used to visit DC, et cetera, but if you get a row of them, I mean, we're almost there with Hamilton to um, Babenstock. Think about it, although we do have the complication of others coming in at leaks. It's is there a solution which can still do the job of what the neutral does from the operational point of view that gets rid of the discrete neutral but also doesn't need the carrier wire, which is lots of overlaps? It's a really good question. With mm. switching, there is. So if you're going to do what the Japanese do and put uh, switches in so that you can effectively separate a lump of railway, mm -hmm. then you can achieve it. Um, the, the question is brilliant because you've hit on one of the reasons why neutral sections are useful. You can parallel up while keeping a neutral section. Yeah, yeah. But the yeah, neutral yeah. section has a reliability and a maintenance cost. It is a tricky one to balance. So some neutrals are in places where they're not really needed. They're just there because of phase separation. And you can take those away fairly easily. But for example, the ones at the west end of Leeds Station, you'd probably want to keep those to segregate an in incident on Transpennine route from an incident on the main leads to London main line. Um, it can be done with switches, but it's it's not an easy answer, if that makes sense. Yeah, so but you can parallel up without getting rid of every neutral section. Thanks. 
Uh, neutral sections, uh, interesting <laughs> argument on Transpennine. Yes, so neutral section is a, a length where the train is not able to draw power. Yes, so it has performance implications where a train is accelerating or regen if it's breaking, obviously. Um, there's an argument on, on TRU about uh, an Arthur Fleury neutral section against the new, the modern Great Western Main Line style carrier line neutral section, yep. which is much, much longer dead section. Um, do SFCs influence where you are keeping neutral sections? Does it influence? Which one you can use, and does it mean we could just return the Arthur Fleury style shorter ones more easily? It doesn't really have. I'm sorry, it, it doesn't really have any impact on that. So the decision on which neutral section to use stays the same. The point you raise about the seconds on journey time is really valid. So we modelled for East Coast PSU2 the journey time saving through SFCs, and it's significant. And the millions of pounds of benefit that come from that are significant. Um, neutral sections we didn't even include in that modelling. But they have another impact on uh, on journey times. Um, the, the the issues we saw historically with neutral sections were that the BICCs were actually pretty good if they were set up well and maintained well, up to a certain speed. When you started going up above 100 miles an hour, you started running into more and more wear on them and more risk of failure. So the balance between the carrier wire neutral sections and the short neutral sections there's a lot of uh, line speed it's in that consideration. It's rather than electrical. It's a mechanical interface, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I'm sure there are people that are desperate to ask questions. So I think that we have to put them off mute for that to work. <laughs> Uh, well, we, uh, Louise is monitoring the chat online, and uh, uh, there aren't any questions online. There's a comment uh, around COVID, Ukraine, and Brexit also affecting material lead times and availability for delivery to site as well as cost. Yeah, so, the funny uh, thing about Brexit was the paperwork wasn't terrible, but the willingness of companies to be willing to supply a small volume of components into the UK and then have to do the paperwork was significant. And suddenly, a lot of people didn't really want to work with us because we were only buying a couple of things from them um, and it wasn't really worth their effort to do the paperwork. Can I just add one word of thanks? So that's the second time I've heard that presentation today. In fact, I've done it twice in about four hours and it was almost <laughs> identical. However, <laughs> just being presented in a different way by a different presenter, I still found that very interesting, even though it's the second time I've heard it today. Excellent. That's good feedback. Thank you. OK, uh, for, for me, I, I think it's the first time I've ever seen simpler, better, greener applied in the real world rather than just shown as a as an orange graphic on a screen. So that that was enlightening. Um, I think Daniel helps us understand why network rail are a non-standard standard customer. Uh, and I guess understand the business case behind it, increasing demand and not compromising reliability. Uh, Richard, some great insight into why PSU to develop as it did, why Hamilton was the right location and the benefits it brings. Uh, and, and the South, the videos have left me thinking, I, oh, it's there. Back. <laughs> um, is it, the videos have left me thinking, why well, we perhaps need our next PWI site visit to be uh, to be to Hamilton, preferably the summer when we can get out and stand in a field in the sunshine rather than in the rain in, in the dark. But we'll, uh, we'll have to work on that together. So uh, if we could say thank you to the three presenters, that would be great. Any your work? So thank you very much to those that joined online. Uh, I will push again the really exciting NR60 Mark II Double Junctions presentation mm -hmm. next month for people online and in the room. Uh, usual rules apply for people in the room if we can clear up after ourselves and we've also got to put the room back to how it was when we started in terms of putting the tables back. So if we can help with that, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Have a safe journey home and we will see you next time. Cheers. Good Thank you. Thank you. So, you last slide indicate that I think